This morning with you, we thank, we thank you for being here. Even though the roads are snowy and it's a bit inconvenient to be here today, we still have some visitors with us. We're glad that you're here as well. <clears throat> when I first started preaching, I worked with my, my dad at a congregation in Indianapolis for, for four years while I was in college. I showed up one day without a suit coat on. And he said, son, where's your uniform? <laughs> well, my uniform right now is sitting on the back of my chair. So if it offends anybody at home, uh, you can run, grab it, bring it back. Maybe you'll get back by the time I'm done. But um, hopefully you, you understand. In a rush. It's a busy week this week. We've got Bible class, a couple sermons today. We're having a preacher's study here at the building in the morning. And so I'm teaching that with several preachers from the Columbus and Ohio area. And... Um, my mind was just elsewhere. And then you got to clean the snow off your car, you know? Sometimes it's just a mess. You know, we're talking about help my unbelief. That's our theme for this year. And our approach in this series is not a one-sermon approach. I feel like a lot of people, when it comes to trying to give some evidences for why they should believe, sometimes we've heard one sermon. We've heard a few proof texts really quickly. And we haven't really got down into the, to the meat and and study things as in-depth as, as we should, and as some people might need. And so our approach this year is the slow and the steady approach. I think it's the approach that Paul might have taken in Athens when those in the marketplace came back on a daily basis to hear him again and over and over again. It's the approach I think Paul might have taken as he taught in the school of Tyrannus, trying to methodically build faith in new disciples one day at a time. And it's the approach that you might make to cooking a, a good stew. You know, you can throw a can of soup in a pot and you can make a soup or a chili, but anybody who's ever done a lot of cooking, you know that if you want to cook a good stew or a good chili or a good soup, got to let those flavors marinate for a while and take your time and work through it, right? You can't be in a rush, be patient, and you're going to enjoy that delicious food a little bit more. And that's our approach. We're trying to build your faith slowly and methodically one lesson at a time. So my goal is for each individual lesson to be helpful. But if it's going to be helpful to you, you've got to keep coming back every Sunday morning. Come back tonight because you're going to hear part two of this lesson. And I always make sure if there's a part two, the second half is better than the first half. So that's just to reward you for coming back the second time to hear it. Uh, so I encourage you to come back this evening and hear the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey might say. You know, in the book of Exodus, we read of Moses and Aaron, who are God's spokesmen. And they arrive at Pharaoh's court and they tell Pharaoh, thus says the Lord God of Israel, let my people go. And Pharaoh's famous answer is, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? He said, I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. And at this point, Pharaoh knew or refused to know of little evidence about the Lord. But as you keep reading through the history of Moses and Aaron's dealings with Pharaoh and the children of Israel. Ten plagues later, a dead child, a drowned army, a mass exodus of slaves. I think Pharaoh had a much better idea as to who the Lord was and as to his power. As we look at Pharaoh, we may wonder, well, what caused his unbelief? Could have been his upbringing. He was just kind of raised not to believe in the God of Israel. Could have been his pride. He was the king and he wasn't going to bow or submit to anyone else. Maybe there was a lack of evidence. Maybe he hadn't seen any evidence thus far. All he knew of the people of Israel is that they were a bunch of slaves who had come to him. He'd forgotten about Joseph and the interpretation of the dreams and the great things Joseph had done for the people of Egypt years later. Maybe it was greed. No, he was basically not going to allow thousands and thousands of his slaves who were doing work for his government and his people to just be let free uh, because that would hamper the people of Egypt economically. So maybe his greed kicked in. There, there's all kinds of reasons. I don't think there's one reason. 
And I want you to consider that as we get into our lesson today, thinking about the causes of unbelief. I, I don't know if you can always pinpoint one specific reason. I think there's a multiplicity of reasons, perhaps several reasons why there may be some who do not believe in the Lord and do not want to obey His voice. But today we want to think about those today who are like Pharaoh, who have no inclination to believe the Lord and understand some of the causes behind this unbelief. Let's start, first of all, with this. As we think about those who would not want to believe in the Lord, sometimes it's just bias against God. And there are some people who are just biased against God for whatever reason. Some people have a stubborn, what I would call a prejudice of unbelief. It's a stubborn prejudice of unbelief. I think Charles Darwin, Darwin is a well-documented case of this. Darwin once wrote of how he, in the past, he would reflect upon the possibility that man could have come from God. And he referred to his thoughts in his early years as those of a theist. But after he wrote Origin of the Species, he convinced himself that such reflections were not to be trusted from the mind of someone who had evolved from animals. Now I think it's interesting, don't you, that he would not trust his mind as he thought of God, but he did trust his inferior mind with reference to his theories of Darwinism coming from animals. Some people just have a bias against God, and for him that was one of the reasons. We're going to look at him a little bit more in the future, but Romans 1 verse 21 says this, even in Scripture, even though they knew God, they, they thought of God, they recognized that there may very well be a God, they did not honor him as God. There were some, I think the Gentiles are being referred to here in Romans 1. They did not honor him as God or give thanks. They became futile in their speculations. They came up with other reasons why they may disbelieve in God or other ideas about gods. And it says their foolish heart was darkened. Our hearts can be darkened. We can have a heart that is full of bias, full of prejudice against believing. In Romans 1 verse 28, we read that just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind. And as we talked about last week, God gives you the right to choose. God gives you free will. If you want to reject God, if you want to believe in God, if you want to be stubbornly biased against God and prejudiced against the very idea of belief, God gives you that right. But when you do so, you're going to do things which are not proper in the sight of God. Romans 1 refers to those who have that mindset. Now, thankfully, some people who had this mindset changed. And Paul is offering to them the opportunity to change and be forgiven through Jesus Christ. But this is the mindset of some. They are biased against God. Psalm 14 in verse 1 says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God in his heart. They've got a bias, a prejudice. Their heart is hard, is another way we might say that. Some people just have a hard heart concerning God. And sometimes the consequence of that hard heart is they don't want to do what God says. They are corrupt. They do corrupt things. Maybe that's sometimes why we don't want to believe in God, because we realize we're doing things God would not approve of. Hebrews 3 and verse 12, it says, Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart. So it applies to the heart. Don't have a prejudiced, unbelieving, evil heart that falls away from the living God. Let's be sure that we guard and watch our hearts. Some people have a bias against God, but sometimes the reason why we don't believe is could have something to do with parental influence. Parental influence, people influence, and families influence. Families influence their children. You've heard the phrase, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. Usually when people say that about my children, it's not always in a positive light. Then I think, well, what are you saying about me, right? Sometimes that's the case. The apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. In Romans 14, 7, it puts it this way. None of us lives for himself and no one dies for himself. Okay, the idea is that we're influenced by other people. We don't live on an island. We're influenced by other people. And th therefore, Romans 14 goes on to talk about don't be a stumbling block to other people. Because you do influence people. You influence your weaker brothers and sisters in Christ. So be careful that you be a positive influence and not cause an occasion to fall for them. In Ephesians chapter 6, 
we're told that fathers are not to provoke your children to anger. You can have a negative influence, fathers, on your children. We're not to have that negative influence, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. God knows you have an influence over your kids. And so be an influence on your children. In Proverbs 29 and verse 15, it says, The rod and reproof give wisdom. We need to discipline our children is the idea behind Proverbs chapter 29. A child who gets his own way brings shame to his mother. Here's what's going to happen when you let your children do whatever they want. They're going to one day embarrass you big time. And so discipline. Uh, families have the, in, the ability to influence for good. But if we believe families have the, in, the ability to influence for good, isn't the opposite also true? We have the ability to influence for evil. Families have the ability to lead children into unbelief. Listen, for every Lois and Eunice that's guiding Timothy into belief, there's a Jezebel who's leading people away from the Lord. For every good example, there's also bad examples out there. Let me give you an example. Stephen J. Gould, he was from Harvard University. He was one of the most famous atheists of the last century. If you were to Google him, you'd find a lot of writings uh, by him. Uh, he wrote of his upbringing in Rocks of Ages. It's called Rocks of Ages, Science and Religion in the Fullness of Life. He wrote this in 99. He noted in this work, and I think this is interesting because it tells you where his mindset came from, but he noted in this work that he was born of parents who had rebelled against the Jewish faith. They had abandoned all theology, all religious belief, and his father was a Marxist, as Stephen Jay Gould was, by the way. You know, what's that tell you? Parents influence. Some people have said to me, well, you're just a Christian because your parents were. Well, I could say that about atheists as well, right? Maybe you're just an atheist and unbeliever because your parents were. That argument gets us nowhere. The importance is we need to follow the truth where it leads, regardless of what our parents did or did not believe or other people do or do not believe. Christians are encouraged to follow the evidence for Jesus Christ, regardless of your parents' point of view. At some point in time, Matthew 10 says, you have got to forsake father and mother, child, brother, sister, son or daughter. You've got to forsake them and pick up your cross and follow after Jesus. Um, he needs to have the most influence over us. There's also educational influences. And I want to take a minute to think with you about this. We referred to this in our last lesson, and I, and I want to think about it just a little bit more here today. Um, it'd be foolish to think that our educational system, and I would say in the private and in the public sphere, I don't want to just, you know, bash the public school system. I'm not here to do that. A lot of you are teaching in the public school system and, and trying to help and trying to be an influence in that school system. So I appreciate that. But there are many in our school systems that have affected and influenced unbelief. Schools have agendas. Some teachers have agendas. Administrations have agendas. They have guiding philosophies which influence the scope and the focus of their teaching. And we see that in biblical history. Uh, we see it with Moses in Acts 7 and verse 22. One of the things that, that Pharaoh wanted to do with Moses is that he was trained in all of the ways of the Egyptians. As Stephen gives his speech, he refers back to Moses, who was trained in the schools of Egypt. They wanted to have an influence on Egypt. It was probably a surprise to Pharaoh when Moses came to him and said, let my people go. I don't want any part of this nation anymore. Pharaoh must have been thinking, what are you talking about? We schooled you. We taught you. We made you what you are. And you want to turn your back on us? You want to leave? But the schools of Egypt would have had an influence upon Moses. Daniel, in Daniel chapter 1 and verse 4, you read that when Daniel was taken as a captive out of Jerusalem, taken to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar, he found the best and the brightest prospects. And what he did is he wanted to train them in the language and the literature of the Chaldeans. He wanted to take them from their belief system, their philosophy, and he wanted to indoctrinate them with Chaldean philosophy. Which, by the way, the language and the literature of the Chaldeans included a lot of things about 
multiple gods about um, uh, astrology, about sorcery, things of that nature. You remember Nebuchadnezzar brings the sorcerers in first before Daniel actually interprets the dream correctly by the power of God. But that's one of the purposes. They even changed the name, the names of Daniel and his three friends, right? It was to let them know all of those names give honor, the new names give honor to Chaldean gods and not to the one true God. He was trying to change who they were. He was trying to change what they believed and what they thought and use these bright prospects for his purposes. And we see that with Daniel. We see that with Paul, who is taught at the feet of Gamaliel, obviously with a Jewish perspective and worldview. And teachers and educators do that today. We have a certain philosophy, a standard, an agenda that we have to teach, and we're expected to teach. Uh, many educators teach evolution as fact, and they won't even consider the thought of God as a rational question. I want to give you an example of one of those individuals who's had a huge influence on our educational system today, John Dewey. You've heard of the Dewey Decimal System, right? It's named after John Dewey. John Dewey, though, was a key player in the progressive movement in education. He was one of the founders of the American Humanist Association in 1933. He's had a huge impact on our schools and education in general. This is what the NEA wrote in an article called Trojan Horse in American Education. It says, an absolute faith, this is with Dewey and his influence, an absolute faith in science became the driving force behind the progressives. The most important idea that would influence the educators was that of evolution. The notion that man, through a process of natural selection, had evolved to his present state from a common animal ancestry. And evolution was as sharp a break with the biblical view of creation as anyone could make. It was quickly picked up by those anxious to disprove the validity of orthodox religion. What kind of influence do you think progressives who had this philosophy in mind had on the public educational system over the years? I could give you numerous examples of men and women in education who left their faith after high school or after college. And sometimes that's no coincidence. We've got to be counteracting. I'm not saying pull your kids out of the public. My kids go to public schools. But I'm saying you better be educating them at home on these issues, on these subjects, if that's where they're going. Um, there are so many videos out now, so many ways that you can educate them in an interesting way that, that they might enjoy, that will be helpful to them. Um, so much evidence, and are we taking the time to teach them? You've got to counteract some of the influence they're going to get from school systems. Um, Here's the thing, if children, if all that we teach them, we don't teach them the opposite side of the story that they might hear at schools. If they're taught to respect their teachers and respect your teachers without question, what effect is that going to have on their faith after they've gone through 12 to 16 years of evolutionary indoctrination? If we let the public schools do all of the teaching and we're not doing any of it at home, and we're not doing any of it here, then don't be surprised when our kids walk out the church door at age 18 and don't return. You can't counteract 30 hours a week of public education with one hour of church a week. We've got to be doing some teaching at home. Parental influence, educational influence is important in trying to teach our kids. I want to give you an example that I just, that I just saw actually this weekend. This just came up. And I want you to think about this. You don't think that the educational system is still pushing some of these agendas and these issues. This is, I think, a great example of it. There was a letter that was sent out to over a thousand school districts in five states by the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Okay. Freedom From Religion Foundation is an organization that is basically made up of atheists. People who don't believe in God, they freedom from religion. You should not be part of a religion. And they have a huge influence threatening and bullying schools sometimes. And this is one of the things that they wrote to schools. Over a thousand school districts in Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, uh, West Virginia, a radius that surrounds the Creation Museum. You've heard of the Creation Museum? My sister lives five minutes from the Creation Museum. I've been there several times and stay with her whenever we go. Um, but there's a lot of people who don't like it. <laughs> right? 
they don't like it. They don't like the idea that creationism is being taught. It, it's not consistent with evolution, and a lot of people think it's not consistent with what the public schools are teaching. Well, this is the letter. Public schools and public school staff may not constitutionally organize trips to the Ark Encounter. They've built a life-size you know, Noah's Ark down there. They may not organize trips to the Ark Encounter or the Creation Museum or any other religious venue. You can go to the zoo, you can go to Kosai, you can go to the Children's Museum in Indy. Why? Because they all teach evolution. That's okay. We're fine with that. Take them there. But you can't go here. You can't go to this museum. We are writing because, unfortunately, Ken Ham, the evangelist, he's the organizer, the, kind of the brains behind Answers in Genesis, who built these two notorious theme parks, continues to encourage public schools to plan field trips to visit the Ark Encounter and the Creation Museum. Though Ham asserts that the law is on his side, this is untrue. Unquestionably, any field trip facilitated, okay, any field trip facilitated by a public school to either attraction would be unconstitutional. In short, it is unacceptable to expose a captive audience of impressionable students to the overtly religious atmosphere of Ham's Christian theme parks. It's okay to expose them to anti-religion or unbelief or evolutionary theory day after day, but you cannot take them on one field trip to this place and just let them see the evidence for themselves. This was... Ken Ham's response, he said, I want to offer free admission to all public schools who receive the Freedom From Religion Foundation and to any other public school in America uh, that want to bring their students to the Ark Encounter and Creation Museum as an official school trip. So teachers, administrators who are out there, you got a free field trip. You just got to pay the bus, all right? Here's what the attorney said, by the way. I want to throw this out there. He said, one of our attorneys who's an expert in constitutional law said this, if public schools were bringing students to the Ark and Museum and declaring this interpretation is the only real truth that you should personally accept, that would be a violation of the Establishment Clause. If classes are coming to the museum or Ark in an objective fashion, however, to show students world-class exhibits and one group's interpretation of the origin of man and earth history, the field trip is just fine as an exceptional and voluntary educational and cultural experience. Public school officials should neither personally endorse nor diminish the museum's view, but should present it objectively. Ultimately, it's possible to attend the Creation Museum or ARC to teach rather than preach and to educate rather than indoctrinate, according to their attorneys. Look, stuff like this happens all the time. You have a group that's meeting in school and they gather around the flag and they hold hands and they pray every morning. Well, we're going to sue the school because there's religion there. I've had kids that had, my own daughter has had a Bible on you need to put that away. That's not supposed to be here. By the way, other teachers stepped up and said, there's nothing wrong with her having a Bible out. But, depends on which teacher you have. Depends on what the administration is going to back. When I was in school, I could give you more stories of, I got sat down a couple of times. You cannot express your view at all, which I wasn't, by the way, but um, don't even allude to it. They knew I was a preacher, so, so they were... Very hesitant. Look, schools have an influence and they are being pressured by organizations like these and we need to understand that. They have an influence. Um, <clears throat> what's some of the other problems? What are some of the other causes of unbelief? Pride can be a cause of unbelief. Just our very own pride. This is Friedrich Nietzsche, who's a German philosopher. Anybody who's taken a philosophy class in college has heard of Nietzsche. But he said this, he said, if, if there were gods, how could I endure it to be no god? His idea was he didn't believe in God, and so he was a God. He was master of his own universe. Pride is a barrier to hearing God. In 1 John 2 and verse 18, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. Sometimes it's our own pride that keeps us from belief. He says it's not from the Father, it's from the world. Proverbs 16, 18 says pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before Stumbling. Well, here's another reason. Sometimes people don't believe because they're living immoral lifestyles. And they realize if they did believe, and if they did submit to a God and a higher power and His Word, they would have to change those lifestyles. Immorality has a huge impact upon why we have an unbelieving world. Some people enjoy immorality, so they hate the idea of God exposing it. And they hate those who do expose it. Jesus knew no sin. 
How did people treat him? Hated by his peers. Put on a cross. Those who enjoy darkness will hate those who live in the light. John 3, right after we read about God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3 tells us that those who love darkness hate the light. And they don't want to come to the light. Take a look at this quote here from R.C. Sproul. He says in, in this book, if there's a God, why are there atheists? He says, the unique moral excellence of Jesus was a massive threat to all his contemporaries, particularly to those who were considered to be the moral elite of his day. It was the Pharisees who were most hostile to Jesus. Though the popular masses hailed the Pharisees for their moral excellence, Jesus exposed them as hypocrites. He broke their curve, providing a new standard under which the old standard of morality dissolved. Jesus disintegrated the firm security of his contemporaries, and when the holy appeared, the pseudo-holy were exposed. Have you heard, perhaps, of Aldous Huxley? We're going to quote from him here in just a minute. Before we do, let's look at Romans chapter 3. It says, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. When we're not righteous, sometimes we don't want to seek after God. Psalm 14, 1, some people have the first part of this memorized. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. But what's the last half say? Well, one of the reasons we don't believe in God may be because we're living very sinful lives and we don't want to think about God. We don't want to think about God judging us, or holding us to a certain standard. It says they are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. This is Aldous Huxley, a quote from him. He also was an unbeliever, but he explains why. And the very reason we're pointing out here today is the very reason why he was an unbeliever. He said, I had motives for not wanting the world to have meaning. Consequently, I assumed it had none and was able without any difficulty to find satisfying reasons for this assumption. The philosopher who finds no meaning in the world is not concerned exclusively with a problem in pure metaphysics. He is also concerned to prove there is no valid reason why he personally should not do as he wants to do. There's a motive. He's saying it's not just science. It's not just apologetics. This is part of it is I want to find an excuse to... Uh, for people to accept my immorality. Myself, he says, as no doubt for most of my contemporaries, the philosophy of meaninglessness was essentially an instrument of liberation. The liberation we desired was simultaneously liberation from a certain political and economic system and liberation from a certain system of morality. We objected to the morality because it interfered with our sexual freedom. If that doesn't define a whole lot of people in America today... Why don't they want to hear anything about God? Why do they blast you if you should even try? Because they don't want to change their lifestyle. Immorality. The Humanist Manifestos document an opposition to Orthodox religions because of their intolerant attitudes towards sexuality and general immorality. Simply put, there are some people who refuse to believe because they know they have to change some aspect of their life and they don't want to change it. So that's why some are unbelievers. But I'm going to look at one last thing with you, and that is the idea of intellectual intimidation. It's a quote from Richard Dawkins. Perhaps you've heard of Richard Dawkins. He's written a book called The Selfish Gene. He's a professor at Oxford. He's very open about his atheism, has written books. He's very evangelistic, if you will, about his atheism. But he said this in one of his books. He says, it's absolutely safe to say that if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid, or insane, or wicked. But I'd rather not consider that. Let me ask you a question. You've got a job interview at Oxford. You want to be a professor at one of the most prestigious universities in the world. And Richard Dawkins is the one who's going to sit down and interview you. You know what he said. You know what he's written. You're going to feel a little intimidated to be open about your faith with somebody who said, you're stupid if this is what you believe. Do you think you'll get hired? 
can be well attested by believers in scientific fields that intellectual intimidation is a real threat. It's a pressure. Uh, peer pressure is not a kid thing. It's an adult thing, too. And sometimes it doesn't feel like you're in the right intellectual circles if you happen to believe some of these things that aren't, among some of your, aren't believed among some of your peers. Ben Stein has a movie, Expelled. The cover of that movie looks really ridiculous, but if you actually watch it, um, it makes a lot of good points about how this has happened in university settings towards believers. Um, there's pressure that's placed upon believers, and some don't like feeling like the minority. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 19 says this, It is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? He's referring to scientists. He's referring to the philosophers of his day. He's referring to those who consider them the academic elites. And he says, has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached. They think you're foolish for preaching this message about Jesus dying on a cross and saving you. But he says, through the foolishness of the message preached, God saves those who believe. We have to remind ourselves when we feel like we're in the minority of what Jesus said in Matthew 7. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are many who go in by it. Narrow is the gate, difficult is the way which leads to life. There are few who find it. <coughs> wrong is wrong, even if everybody is doing it, and right is right, even if no one is doing it. Proverbs 3 says, trust in the Lord. That's all we're wanting to do. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. He shall direct your paths. The real danger of allowing all of those causes that we've just talked about to shut our eyes and our ears and our hearts to the truth is that faith comes by hearing. And hearing comes by the word of God. And if you shut out the word of God for whatever your excuse or reason or justification might be, then you can't ever be a person of faith. And if you're not a person of faith, then you cannot please God. And God wants you more than anything. And he sends preachers and teachers and parents and Christians like me and like all the people here. He sends people like us to share the word of God with you because he wants more than anything for you to be saved. He wants you to believe, and He wants to have relationship with you. You are His special creation. He, your creator, and He wants more than anything for you to be with Him in all of eternity. But we cannot win the unbelieving to belief if we allow these reasons to speak more loudly in our ears than the voice of God through His Word. And we pray that the voice of God will speak loudly in your mind, in your hearts, in your ears. If you're someone who believes in God and you believe in His Son, Jesus Christ, who He sent to earth to die for you so your sins might be forgiven, we encourage you to turn. Quit letting your sin get in the way of obeying and following God. Turn from your sins. Give your heart and your life over to Him. You can spend an eternity with Him. We can baptize you this morning. You can confess your faith in Him this morning and become a new creature, His new creation. We invite you to do that. While together we stand and while we sing.